Government hands over a huge consignment of heavy agricultural machinery and spare parts to the National Center for Studies and Experimentation in Agricultural Mechanism. The Prime Minister, Head of Government, Joseph John Gute, oversees the retrocession. Cameroon joins over 200 countries to advocate for climate financing in the United Nations Climate Conference, the Azerbaijan. 1.3 billion civil francs is sought by African leaders for mitigation and adaptation. The indomitable lines of Cameroon pool is zero all tie with Namibia. The squad tops Group J with 11 points and have one match to go for the 2025 AFCON. The highlights of the encounter come up on the 7.30 news tonight. And those were the headlines of our news. Thanks for joining us. I'm Esther Kima. Now on to the retrocession of the Ebolova Tractor Assembly Plant to the National Center for Studies and Experimentation in Agricultural Mechanism. The event was chaired today by the Prime Minister Head of Government, Joseph John Gute. Heavy agricultural machinery and spare parts acquired by government were handed over to the center's officials in a bid to thrust public and private agribusinesses as well as to reduce imports. Star building correspondent Christian Chiratam has the details. These are the machines which have been retroceded to the National Center for Studies and Experimentation in Agricultural Mechanization. They shall help in opening up roads to production basins, clearing and stabilizing farmlands, transporting crops, seedlings and other equipment amongst others. The machines were acquired by the government of Cameroon under two projects and through cooperation with India at the cost of about 80 billion US dollars. During the retrocession ceremony attended by members of government, directors general and heads of agro-industries, the machines were described as crucial to Cameroon's drive towards import substitution and agricultural mutation. The Director General of Cinema, André Caroline Mebande Bate, said the machines put her center in a strong position to help boost agricultural production in Cameroon. The Minister of the Economy, Alamin Usman May, said the acquisition of the machines and their retrocession to Cinema aim at boosting food self sufficiency in the country. The Prime Minister Head of Government, Joseph Diongute, in his keynote, thanked the Indian High Commissioner to Cameroon for his country's support towards the materialization of the projects. He noted that the machines are a result of President Paul Bia's promise to create a tractor assembly plant in Ebolova. Joseph Diongute invited the GM of Cinema to put in place an aggressive and efficient strategy to ensure that agro-industries like Semri, CDC, and private promoters get access to the machines under favorable conditions. He invited business persons, rural actors, and farmers associations to make maximum use of the machines. Cut. On to news from Parliament, Burley asks after the official opening of the third ordinary session of the 2024 legislative year, members of the National Assembly have begun work effectively. The Chairman's Conference, led by the House Speaker, the Right Honorable Kava Egejibu, today deemed admissible 10 bills from government. The bills were later on table before Parliament in an ensuing plenary sitting presided over by the Senior Deputy Speaker, Honorable Ilarion Itong. Charles Ibune tells us more. The day began with the chairman's conference held in the office of the House Speaker. Chaired by the House Speaker, the Right Honorable Kava Yege Jibu, the chairman's conference had just one item on the agenda. The communication to the Bureau of the National Assembly, bills already tabled by the government. Amongst the bills, the one to govern civil protection in the country, aimed at improving the legal framework to better manage disasters in the country, which are recurrent. The one relating to the organization and practice of traditional medicines in Cameroon to reconcile modern and customary healthcare methods. The bill to authorize the President of the Republic to ratify the Beijing Treaty on Audiovisual Performances. The one to authorize the President of the Republic to ratify the Convention of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation to combat international terrorism. The other tabled bills are the Settlement Bill of the State of Cameroon for the 2023 financial year, the one on local taxation to empower the financial powers of decentralized governments, 
the law on civil registration system to solve the problem of the over 7 million citizens without an identity in the country. The government has also forwarded for examination to the National Assembly the text to authorize the President of the Republic to ratify the Convention on the Establishment of the Organization for Marine and Cameroon's Accession to the Geneva Act on the Lisbon Agreement on Appellations of Origin and Geographical Indications. The bills were later presented in a plenary chat by the Senior Deputy House Speaker, Honorable Hilarion Eton. Still at the National Assembly, the problem of professionalizing training in Cameroon has come under sharp scrutiny in the course of an education forum presided over by the Senior Deputy Speaker, Honorable Ilarion Etong. In a keynote speech delivered by the Minister of Employment and Vocational Training, Isa Chiroma Bakari, it was emphasized that professionalization can greatly roll back poverty and unemployment. The Education Committee President, Honorable Gabriel Fanja, is the initiator of the exchange, as we hear in this report by Ayim Bile. Unemployment remains one of the key problems the government has to fix, especially for the young people, and one of the ways already undertaken to tackle the challenges, professional training across the country to equip them with skills. Vocational training of youths is very, very important considering the fact that the head of state is talking about taking Cameroon into emergence in the year 2035. This cannot be done or it cannot be realized when we have a very high rate of unemployment in our country. The Parliamentary Exchange Forum on the Unemployment Question in the country was chaired by the Senior Deputy Speaker, Hila Hyun Itong, and organized by the Committee on Education. Today, we have decided to organize a forum that has brought together the main actors. We have the executive bench that is here, the members of parliament are here, we have enterprises, operators are also here. So we put our heads together to find lasting solution on the reasons why the rate of unemployment in our country is still very high, and our youths with very high diplomas, degrees, and masters don't have employment. The forum brought together parliamentarians, government officials, and captains of industries to chart pathways with the use of technology to reduce unemployment in the country. Parliamentarians have been treated to a banquet offered by the Minister Delegate at the Presidency of the Republic in charge of relations with Parliament, Francois Bolvin Wakata. This was in the presence of members of government and other officials thrilled by a display from the full court zones and Cameroon's cherished culinary. Gilbert Ongene reports. After their participation at the opening ceremonies of the ordinary session at the National Assembly and at the Senate, parliamentarians gathered at the Yaoundé Hilton Hotel for a banquet. The banquet is offered by the Minister Delegate at the Presidency in charge of relations with the Assemblies, François Bolvin Wakata. This in the presence of other cabinet members, the bureau members of the Senate and the National Assembly, other invited guests, and staff of the secretariats of both houses of parliament. This banquet has become a statutory meeting with parliamentarians to exchange and discuss issues beyond protocol order. The dinner is spiced by cultural performance from the four cultural zones to depict the diversity of the people they represent in parliament. Other sequences were performances from humorists to lighten the atmosphere for the evening after a day of speeches at the opening session of parliament. On to one of our top stories, the United Nations Climate Conference known as COP21-29, grouping over 50,000 persons from nearly 200 member countries has opened in Baku, Azerbaijan. The participants are seeking a deal on climate financing to support the clean energy transition in developing economies. Cameroon's delegation to the summit comprises officials and experts from the ministries of the Environment and Nature Protection, Forestry and Wildlife, as well as the National Observatory on climate change. They will be presenting the country's climate action plan during the summit.
and the effects of climate change have been catastrophic lately. The world over, shifts in temperatures and weather patterns have caused floods, landslides and other disruptions in human activity, especially in agriculture. The impact is felt mostly by farmers who witness destruction in short cycle crops like maize, beans, potato and tomato. Cynthia Saptala caught up with some farmers who were distraught by the situation. Cameroonian farmers subjected to the shift in weather patterns. For how long will it rain? No one can tell for sure, and so crop productivity is uncertain. For long-time farmers like Papa Ramon, who cultivates cassava, yams, plantains, cocoa, and corn, climate change has affected the output of short-cycle crops. Pull on maize. It's mostly maize and yam that is affected. You plant and then the rain stops, and the quantity you harvest is small. Now in the villages, women have been unable to harvest yams like they usually do in August because we witnessed dry periods between July and August. Because of no rains, we had to start cultivating maize in September, and very soon we are already getting into the dry season. According to experts, the level of agricultural yield varies for each crop depending on the degree of tolerance to humidity. If you take uh, the maize, you see there is a shift in the seasons. When you expect rains to start, you don't have rains. In the north, on the forecast that was done by the National Observatory, it was clearly indicated that they were going to suffer from uh, dry spells that will last even for up to 21 days. Farmers are urged to rely on forecasting and adapt to the changing climate for an increase in harvest. Experts say efforts are being made to provide weather predictions to those in the hinterlands so as to minimize losses. The issue of cutting down for soil continues to generate discussions in the current climate change summit in Azerbaijan. African leaders are using the COP29 platform to demand the sum of 1,300 billion CV francs to enable their countries sustain the fight against the climate change impact. Environment Desk Editor Prince Will Mukwele Aduma argues for the legitimacy of the demand in this report. Taking different turns to make a common demand, 1,300 billion CFA francs for Africa's resilience to climate change impact. The African Union Agenda 2063 is based on climate neutral, clean energy, clean industrialization. Where is this money going to come from? We need Trans-African Railway, energy infrastructure. Despite the Paris 21 launch of the Loss and Damage Fund, Africa continues to receive the insignificant 3% of what is raised for the cause. African countries have not contributed to climate change as much as advanced economies. And there's an urgency for they to lead that change. And so because our budgets are constrained due to Russia's war in Ukraine, due to inflation. As the rest of the world listen to Africa's argument in COP29, efforts like Cameroon's to cut emission to 35% by 2030 must be given attention. Our budgets are too important for other aspects of um, economic development such as education, healthcare, ensuring sustainability in agricultural and so we don't have money to invest in climate projects. With carbon still shooting up and fossil fuel not picking up, Africa deserves empowerment to enable her rise above the dictates of climate change. A major mitigation adopted by governments is the carbon credit method, which involves taking off tons of carbon dioxide and greenhouse emissions from the environment. The carbon credits are most often traded on carbon markets where they are purchased, transferred and exchanged. But just how does this function? Juliana Befolo has been finding out for the 730 News. To reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, the Kyoto Protocol adopted on December 11, 1997 included a mechanism for countries to trade emissions with each other. One of these mechanisms is a carbon credit. Carbon credit can be considered as a currency that brings together the polluters, those emitting carbon, and those who are part of the solution by investing time and effort and knowledge in the capacity to sequestrate carbon. Most of today's interim solutions involve the use of the carbon markets. The polluter of those uh, emissions 
could find somebody somewhere who is able to generate a sequestration capacity. At the same level, the consequences of the activity of the polluter. When all this is done, there is a value attached to the carbon that is sequestrated, and that value will be paid by the polluter. Environmentalists say issues pertaining to climate change is an equation whose solution needs to be found by everyone. Away from climate change management policies, the Resilient Cities project geared towards developing inclusive and resilient cities has been officially launched in Marua. The over 7 billion project, which targets a 5-kilometer stretch covering the Zeleng and Uru Chede neighborhoods in the Marua 1 council area was launched by the Minister of Housing and Urban Development, Celestine Kechakotes. My Moina Joya has the details. I see. Today, as with the C2D project two years ago, Marwa's population welcomes the PDV project for more inclusive and resilient cities. Neighborhoods like Ziling and Uruchede in Marwa 1 are key beneficiaries of the 7.5 billion CFA France initiative, which aims to launch vital roadworks to reduce catastrophes. The neighborhood is dangerous and very remote. With the project that also includes street lights, we hope there will be more security. Minister Celestine Kechako Tess pledged to closely monitor the project's progress to ensure it stays on track. Today is 7.5 billion that we are launching here. That's why I've signed a performance contract convention with all the company who have been awarded. I will not accept any delay. A performance contract signed with contractors guarantees completion within six months. The minister also inaugurated the Kakatari Road stretch in Marwa 1, underscoring the government's commitment to improve living conditions. It has not been all bleak at the Chang Cliff landslide, as in spite of the number of deaths recorded, there have been miraculous survivors. Mona Clifford is one of them. He was amongst the drivers of heavy duty machinery used in the rescue efforts who were submerged by the second mudslide. Today, he says he was saved by God and continues to search for others in the rubble. Eric Langmia Wolfer tells us more. He was involved in a rescue operation when the first landslide occurred. Three years later, things completely transformed when another massive descent of rocks, soil and earth overturned the excavator he was using to clear off the debris. At this point, he had to fight for his life and he says his survivor was all thanks to God and the timely intervention of other rescue operators. The first, the first landslide occurred around 9.30. So they call us that there's a landslide at Fales and Chang. So before we came, we met the machine at the council. The council machine was here working. So later, they told us to so bring our two machines. We have worked for about three hours. The ground was too much. So around three o'clock before the heavy landslide occurred, I saw how the ground was coming. So I tried to turn my machine to escape. The gang have already pulled the machine down, so I succeeded in coming out to this cabin, the other machine. So I was running on the ground, running, so that's how I escaped the, the situation. After a short stay at the hospital, he overcame his fears and once again is actively involved in operation to retrieve those still trapped under the rubble. Every day we try to dig, we walk, try to try to remove the people that are in. Mona Clifford works closely with the Army Rescue Unit in a move to remove the corpses of those still under the wreckage. And there is no doubt in that Clifford is a testimony of God's grace. In other news, the third edition of the Douala Economic Forum is underway with stakeholders encouraged to work hand in glove to boost the attractiveness of the city of Douala. Launched by Governor Samuel Jodone Ivaha de Boa, this year's edition focuses on transport, logistics, real estate and import substitution. Cynthia Aitim, now reports for the 730 News. 
A conducive environment with an appealing geographical landscape as well as updated facilities are believed to be catalysts for the development of a city. Through the Douala Economic Forum, which is in its third edition, the bottom-to-top initiative to scale up the city's attractiveness is saluted. Import substitution, improved transport logistics and real estate are seen as necessary aspects to tackle challenges faced by the ever-growing city of Douala. The challenges facing the city were raised by economic operators and the city mayor has called for a synergy of actions between stakeholders for the smooth run of economic activities so that we can have the city we deserve. As a means of solving development challenges faced by Douala, the city council at the launch reviewed some strategies. We have acquired some land in Aquano, which will be put at the disposal of real estate agent as a solution to lodging challenges. We equally have the rapid transit bus project, which will come with the development of 88 kilometers of roads in Douala. Speaking at the launch, the literal governor Samuel de Doneva de Boa stressed on the need for all to work as one for the continuous growth of the city of Douala. The Douala Economic Forum Forum will end on Friday, November 15. In continuation of our reports on the safety net and economic inclusion projects of the World Bank, ongoing since 2013, at least 25% of Cameroonian households have so far been beneficiaries. The Minister of the Economy, Planning and Regional Development, Alamin Usman May, underscored the essence of the initiative which has contributed in rolling back poverty at a meeting today in Yaoundé. Florence Ngomba Nanyongo reports. Approximately 10 million people in Cameroon live below the poverty line. This situation has been exacerbated by recent crises, food insecurity, and the threat of climate change. The Social Safety Net Project is supporting vulnerable communities address these challenges. The country's ambition to become an emerging uh, economy uh, needs to go alongside a national system that makes sure nobody is left behind. There is a system to take care of the vulnerables. This workshop aims to establish a strategic roadmap for the continued success of the project while facilitating the exchange of experiences. We are, of course, the largest uh, South Asian program uh, with 9 million uh, beneficiaries. So the government of Pakistan has taken social safety extremely seriously. This is how we target the most vulnerable. Emphasis was also on the impact of the project on the nation's development agents. This workshop is important for us because it permits us to share the best practices of other countries who are implementing this program. Economic Minister stated that the project holds great promise in Cameroon's 2035 emergency targets. In diplomacy, the United Council of Cities of Cameroon has met with the Italian ambassador to Cameroon, His Excellency Filippo Scamacca del Mugo today in Yaoundé. They discussed ways of using the Italian decentralization model in scaling up the Cameroonian experience on people-oriented developments. Charles Ibune has the details of the exchange with the Council's president, Augustin Tamba. Inside the Italian embassy in Yaoundé, Cameroon today, they are here. Members of the United Councils and Cities of Cameroon granted audience by the Italian Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to Cameroon, Filippos Camaca de Morgo. The delegation of the Cameroonian United Councils and Cities is headed by its president, Augustin Tamba, and accompanied by some executive members. Both parties discuss a wide range of issues, especially agriculture, livestock, and how to commercialize Cameroonian products in Italy. And as Cameroon opts in scaling its decentralization process, Italy can be a source of inspiration. The United Councils and Cities of Cameroon delegation equally talked on other issues like education and the fostering of cooperation between Cameroon and Italy.
In Act 3 of our running series on psychosocial fields, we spotlights the role of marriage counsellors tonight. These couple therapies help with relationship tune-ups and serious repairs. Generally, they encourage couples to open up, highlighting the strengths in their relationships and what might be causing distress. Yoti Kaleli Songa spoke with Reverend Amos Benben Kebi, a marriage counsellor who now shares his experience. A flare of anger in his marriage made him uncover a profession which he now practices. When I got married to my wife, we started quarreling. It went to a point where my wife had to tell me that I am not the man she got married to. So I decided to make a search on, you know, who is a husband? Today, Reverend Amos Ben Ben is a certified marriage counselor who trained in Nigeria and the United States of America. We run a school and it takes at least 26 months to be trained as a marriage counselor. And by being a graduate, you are qualified to build healthy homes. About 10 years later, he tells us his sessions, which are either face-to-face -face or virtual, happen with a tang of emotional intelligence. You can be a doctor academically, but you have a first school living emotionally. You can be a prof. When it comes to understand your wife, you are zero. Even though yet to be wildly embraced in Cameroon, licensed marriage and family therapists in the country could request a consultation fee of 5,000 CFA francs. When I started marriage counseling, it was basically free. In fact, I was yearning just to help somebody live well. But now, in addition to that, I also live by marriage counseling. You have to come with a fee. Couples who have tried, say, having a marriage coach adds piquancy to their love story. It is imperative to, have to see one. The place in our society of today is very, very important. Marriage counselors advise that even when things appear rosy, seeking their expertise yearly is necessary to keep a happy home. Interesting expressions there to describe marriages. The new British High Commissioner to Cameroon, His Excellency Matthew David Woods, has been to the Southwest region for an official visit. Received by the Governor of the region, Bernard Okalia Bilai, the British diplomat exchanged on ways of fostering cooperation ties and promoting Commonwealth values amongst peoples. Almost Ombo Suzimu Njua reports on the other horizons of partnership that were explored. The British High Commissioner to Cameroon is received in the Southwest region by the Governor. His very first visit to the Southwest region, an opportunity for the British diplomat to learn more about the region, which he says has a long-standing history with the United Kingdom. I've been in Cameroon for, for six weeks now. I was really keen to come here. And of course, it's a region which has enormous you know, history and, and connections to the UK. So it's lovely to, to be here and to try to understand more about both the history and, and uh, the current and indeed the future of our relationship. For close to an hour, the diplomat and the governor exchanged on several matters of interest and explored ways to foster collaboration in the economic and cultural domains as well as security. In culture news, the Paramount Fund of Pinyin in the Division of the Northwest Region has been presented to the Pinyin community in Yaoundé. His Royal Highness Fund Kenneth Kan Asobo III, who begins the reign of peace, unity and development, was welcomed in an esteemed cultural manner depictive of the Pinyin people. Victor Siga was there for the 7.30 News. Pinyin sons and daughters from far and near in joy as they welcomed the Paramount Fund, His Royal Majesty von Kenneth Kan Asobo III. He was chosen and presented on Friday, November 10, in the Native Kingdom. He will be leading the Pinin people in Santa Subdivision, Mesam Division of the Northwest Region. We are happy and we thank God for this day, a day that we have waited for for very long. Because the Pinin people, for almost 50 years, we had a region in Pinin. In Pinin folkloric reading and tradition, the third paramount ruler is given the honor to him after a seven-year vacancy on the throne. Why the sons and daughters expressed the joy of having a traditional guide. They were urged to promote peace and living together and make the culture known wherever any Pinin chai finds themselves. After the memorable reception, the Paramount Fund will be returning to the palace 
in the Pinin Kingdom where he reigns. On today's obituary, parliamentary honors have been paid to Senator Carl Moses Mbofung, who passed on to eternity last this September following an illness. The solemn ceremony presided over by Senate Vice President, His Majesty, for Tabe Tandon Depso. The valuable contributions made by the lawmaker in the institution were highlighted. Doris Batetato Equa reports on the tributes paid to the first Professor Emeritus of the University of Gaudere. Sorrow filled the air at the Senate hemicycle as senators and some members of government converged to bid farewell to the late Senator Carl Moses Mbufung, who had barely served in that capacity for just a little over a year before death came calling. His incisive and informed contributions during deliberations within the Committee on Economic Affairs, Planning and Regional Development were lauded by Senate Vice President for Tabe Tando in his eology. He was very, 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 very active and telling me that uh, since he's, he's a professor, he's very much interested in anything that concerns education. An amazing family man. He was. He made sure that all the family was always together, always organizing parties and inviting everybody. Through all his career of education, he was a man of great determination. The late emeritus professor, Senator Mbofung, was a leading figure in the scientific world and his reputation extended far beyond Cameroon. He will be buried in Bamesi, Ndop, where he was born some 74 years ago. And in one of our top stories, the indomitable lions of Cameroon and the brave warriors of Namibia have pulled a zero all tie in the day five match of the qualifiers of the 2025 Afghan. The indomitable lions are leading Group J with 11 points, while Namibia recorded its first points. Nana Walter Wilson has a highlight of the encounter today in Johannesburg. The indomitable lions of Cameroon continue to top Group J with 11 points, despite pulling a zero all tie with the brave warriors of Namibia earlier today. In a lackluster game, played in an empty Orlando Stadium in Johannesburg, South Africa, the host ground for the Namibians, Coach McBreeze and his team failed to make the difference in 92 minutes of play. In the first segment, like in the second, the new players brought into the game who have not been in the Afghan campaign so far, like Ivan Neyu, Guy Kilama, Frank Magri, George Kevin Kudu, and Dalin Yongwa did not bring in the expected spies. Keeper Andre Odana was on the alert as he prevented Peter Shalulile and the brave warriors from embarrassing Cameroon. Toujours bien le centre, le point d'Andre Onana, mais qui n'est pas allé bien loin. While Cameroon maintains leadership in Group J and qualification reassured for Morocco 2025, the Namibians are out of the race. And still in sports, preparations for the 8th edition of the National Games known as Dixiad are gaining steam with the organizing committee visiting the different sites and lodging facilities to host the event in Yaoundé. The games, which will run from December 11 to 21, will be a forum to exhibit talents in multiple disciplines. The committee members have held the state of the facilities and enjoined the workers to speed up what is yet to be completed. Sion Wazake tells us more. Athletes from the 10 regions of Cameroon will as from December 11 to 21, 2024, converged on Yaoundé to compete for precious metals. The 8th edition of the National Games dubbed Dixiat will see them rival in several sports disciplines. For a smooth competition, the organizing committee has been touring the sites to host the games. They visited the athletics track of the Olympic Sports Complex, the Military Stadium, the Yaoundé Wada Multipurpose Sports Complex, the Yaoundé One University, and some lodging facilities. Everything is maintained in good shape, and we believe that uh, when the athletes and all the officials will be here for, for the competition, they will be very satisfied. Barely a month to the sports and culture, all is almost on point. We are quite ready. We will continue to, to, to prepare in serenity, without pressure. After Garwa in 2023, Young Day is set to host and expose talents from the 10 regions of Cameroon to compete at the multidiscipline sports showpiece. 
And that will be all for this edition of the 730 News, in which you heard that government has handed over a huge consignment of heavy agricultural machinery and spare parts to the National Center for Studies and Experimentation in Agricultural Mechanization. The Prime Minister, Head of Government, Joseph Jankute, today presided over the retrocession ceremony, and Cameroon has joined over 200 countries to advocate for climate financing in the United Nations Climate Conference in Azerbaijan. 1.3 billion silver francs is sought by African leaders for mitigation and adaptation strategies as the world is hit by climate change hazards. More news comes up in another 30 minutes with Romeo out in Chisengak. I'll be back tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. God willing, our programs continue on CRTV and on CRTV News. Stay tuned. Good night.